Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. What is your name? It's a pretty simple question, right? How do you feel about your name? That one's a bit more complicated. Do you wish you had a different name? How did your parents choose your name? Is there a story behind it? Are you named after someone else? How did you choose your children's name? How did you choose your dog's name? Which one did you spend more time on? <laughs> names are interesting things, and nicknames are even more interesting, I think, because our birth names are laid upon us before anything is really known about our character. They usually say more about our parents than they do about us. Our nicknames, however, are far more revealing, perhaps, about who we are. Or maybe it's more accurate to say that they reveal who others think we are. In that way, nicknames can be endearing, or they can be cruel. They can give us to something to shoot for, or they could label us for life in ways we wish they didn't. Sometimes we live with names that never seem to suit us, and we search for other ones. I knew someone who changed her name twice, but still she was not satisfied. Somehow she just couldn't find the name that told the world who she really was. It always felt to me like her search for a name was really a search for an identity that she could live with. How many names do you go by? You might have lots of them. Do you like all of them? Do they all suit you? Perhaps you were called one thing as a child and another when you were on the high school track team and another when you were in college and maybe another one when you began your career. Maybe you have a secret name that only a very few people call you by or maybe that you call yourself. Women are often faced with the question of name changes when they get married and it can feel like a political minefield. Years ago, and I mean years ago, there was no debate. When you got married, you took your husband's name. When I married nearly 27 years ago, the option of holding on to your original last name, your maiden name, was becoming more common. And I had to justify my choice to take my husband's name. And it felt very retro at times. But being just barely 23, I figured I'd have, you can do the math now. I. <laughs> I figured I'd have many more years as a married woman than a single one, and so far that's true. So I decided I would simplify our family life if we all had the same name. What was strange was that my new name changed my ethnic identity as well. I was used to being Anne Connolly with the map of Ireland written all over my face, and the name suited me. When I became Anne Rolowski, people assumed that my family came from Poland, or Russia, not that there's anything wrong with that. And it felt pretty odd to me, though. It took me a while to feel comfortable answering to Rolowski. In our gospel this morning, we are faced with the power of a name. Jesus comes upon a man who is tormented with inner demons, so much so that he is a danger to others and to himself. In many translations of this story, he is simply called the demoniac. Talk about a label. Labeling someone by their condition happens a lot. Someone is called a diabetic, a schizophrenic, a paraplegic. I tend to resist that kind of labeling, however, for it attempts to sum up a whole person's life simply by the medical condition that they have. My aunt, then, is not a person who has diabetes as well as a PhD in literature and a wicked tennis serve and a love of opera. She's been limited to her condition. She is a diabetic. It flattens out the complicated, multifaceted reality of the person. And just so it must have been for the man in our story this morning. Any other details of his life have been forgotten including his name. He is no longer a husband or father or artist or blacksmith or person with a passion for his mother's cooking or a love of the sea. He is simply 
a demoniac. I imagine he must have had a brutal life, for Mark describes him as having been shackled and chained for most of it. As I read the story, I wondered if the chains came before or after his demonic possession. Were they the cause or the result? Had the outer circumstances of his life led to his mental state, or was it the other way around? We may never know. All we know is that he is beyond the reach of other human beings, and he is living among the tombs, and he is alone, and he is in agony. This story seems to be one of those passages that is almost too bizarre for us to relate to. As 21st century folks, we don't always know what is meant by demon possession in the scriptures. Are we to take it literally? Are they talking about what we might call mental illness today, perhaps schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder? Or is it, as so many of the gospel stories are, a parable for us to explore and question and live into on many different levels? It could be any of those things. But if I read the story again this time, I hear a different kind of story coming through. What is your name? Jesus asks. And the man answers, I am Legion, for we are many. And this time I hear a story about a man wrestling, not with multiple personalities, but with multiple identities. And I hear Jesus asking him which one is really true. Our names mean a lot to us. And so I think it's very important that Jesus asks the tormented name man what his name is. To name something gives it value, sets it apart, makes it harder to forget or overlook. Growing up, we had some friends who lived on a farm, and we went to visit one weekend, and the oldest daughter took us children out to look at the pigs. And I thought they were adorable, all pink and fuzzy and Wiggly. There was one pig that was especially cute. What's his name, I asked. Oh, we don't name them, my friend told me. Why not, I wondered. And her little, bro her little brother piped up, tell them what happened to Squeakers. And just then their mother called out, breakfast is ready. <laughs> and I flirted with becoming a vegetarian for a day or two after that. So my guess is that the demoniac in the story isn't given a name because it also makes it easier to ignore him, to marginalize him, to forget about him. But Jesus doesn't do that. He sees him and addresses him. He asks him who he is. He humanizes him. When the man replies that he has many names, using the word legion, he is revealing the source of his pain. That word legion would be a loaded word for folks who first heard this story. For legion, a Latin word out of place in a Greek text, was a word used by the Roman military. It was a battalion of 6,000 men. The presence of the Roman soldiers in Israel was a cause of great fear and pain for Jesus' community. Having them occupy the countryside was a reminder that the people of Israel were not in charge of their destiny. Someone else was calling the shots. They could not live authentically as the people God called them to be. And so when the man uses the name Legion, he is saying a lot about how he feels inside. He feels occupied by dangerous forces. And so he gives the name Legion. Of course, underneath this idea of names is really the idea of identity. And we have lots of those. We have family identities. Parent, sister, brother, spouse, grandparent. We have professional identities. Teacher, lawyer, chef, shopkeeper, executive, cashier. And we have our personal ones. Undiscovered poet. Secret gambler. Unrequited lover. Aspiring artist. Angry rebel. We allow the world to see some of these identities, but not all. 
Often we are many of these things simultaneously. They overlap and they compete and they can exhaust and confuse us. And if we are really clever, we can even hide them from ourselves. And Jesus' question posed to us might invite the same answer as in our story. I really don't know my name, Jesus, because I have so many. Life often pressures us to be something to one person and something to another and something else still to a third. And we ease our way through it by faking who we are here and hiding who we are there and spitting the truth just a little so we can avoid life's landmines. We convince ourselves that this is what it takes to navigate our relationships and our roles and all the while putting on a false face or a number of false faces until we forget what our real face looks like. We convince ourselves that it is still there, that true face, that genuine self, but when we try and name it, we realize we can't. Our names are legion, and they are occupying us. In the story, Mark uses the metaphor of demon possession, but our names can become legion in many more ordinary ways. When we compromise our values, when we are tempted to make moral shortcuts because the price of staying true to our convictions might be the loss of a friend or income or reputation. Our name can become legion when we conform mindlessly to social convention, deciding it is necessary to abandon our truth because it will make others uncomfortable or because the convention plays into our need for power and attention. And so we go with it regardless of how we feel inside. Titles can do that a lot. I don't know if any of you have a title that comes with your job. I'm called Reverend, or to be technically correct, the Reverend. Or if I was Episcopalian, the right Reverend. It's a title that convention has bestowed on me because I am ordained and you have called me to be your pastor. It's supposed to mean that I am a person who is reverent, who is responding to holiness. It's supposed to set me apart from the rest of the folks in a special way. People often act, act differently around me when I learn that I'm a pastor. They get self-conscious about swearing, and they give me way too much credit for being a good person. Sometimes they feel the need to confess things, which is why I never tell anyone on an airplane what I do for a living. <laughs> They treat me like I'm special, and so that title of reverend both tells me who I am and in a way makes me who I am. And that kind of title can be very seductive and very dangerous. Pastors can often start believing they are different from everyone else and abuse that power. They hide behind the label and even fool themselves until Jesus comes along and says, what is your name? And if I start to say, well, I'm the Reverend Anne, he butts in and he says, do you think that title impresses me for a minute? Do you think that title really gives you any greater awareness or of grace than anyone else in this world? I want to know who you really are, Anne, the flawed, insecure, messy person underneath. That's the person I want to know. That's the person I love. Jesus calls me out of my false self and recognizes me for who I am. He offers me integrity, wholeness, in the midst of my fragmented, multi-named self. And it is only then that I ever can experience the wholeness, the holiness of what he offers. Under all of our names, under all of our labels and titles and identities, is the person that Jesus seeks, the one he recognizes, the one he affirms, the one he challenges, the one he loves, the one who resists the labeling and the stereotypes of others, the one we know to be true. But she can be hard to find. So sometimes the best we can do for right now is just to admit that we are complicated, that there are many sides to who we are, and that we are wrestling with that. When the man admits that he has many names, admits that he is complicated, that he is not just the demoniac, the unclean spirits are released, and they move into a herd of pigs who throw themselves off a cliff 
and into the sea. A few verses later, the story concludes with Jesus telling the man to go back to his family and his friends and let them see what Jesus has done for him. Let them see who he really is. And I read this to say that Jesus is asking him to let his new identity, his authentic identity, speak to the healing power of God. He asks him to live into his real name, the one that God alone knows. What is your name? Jesus asks us. How would you answer? Amen.